Thank you very much for coming. Hello, my name Hello. is my name. Hi, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an attorney here at Myrick O'Connell, and thank you for coming to our offices. This is the first of what I think will, if if this works, be probably a really a multi-installment series uh, that I want to do dealing with specific issues around elder law. I do nothing but elder law here. There are 60 of us here at Myrick O'Connell. Um, there are 20 here in, in Westboro. We're actually the biggest law firm in this area. Um, and then there were 40 in Worcester. And they all do other stuff. And I do nothing but elder law, which I like because if I've got other issues, I can ask somebody else how to figure them out. Um, but elder law really is, people ask me, what is elder law? Well, I tell them, uh, probably 80% of my clients, 90% of my clients are either worried about Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's, or they know someone who has Alzheimer's. And the reason why they're talking to me is that, as you've, many people have come to learn, Alzheimer's is the one major disease, Alzheimer's and those cluster of other diseases that cause dementia, Alzheimer's is the one major disease that isn't covered by Medicare. If you have cancer, no problem. You need operations, you need chemo, all these things are covered by Medicare. If you have serious heart problems, you do transplants, you do this and that, and it's all covered by Medicare. But if you just need a lot of help, staying at home and with some kind of things that were just to manage at home, um, Medicare isn't covering that. Only Medicaid is, so that you find yourself, unless you can qualify for Medicaid, and MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for Medicaid, um, unless you can be qualifying for that, you find yourself paying out of pocket. So um, the typical situation that people find themselves in, it, well, let me talk, well, let me tell you a little, let me give you a little bit of background before we kind of start here. So the folks that I'm gonna talk to you about are my friends Frank and Mary, uh, my make-believe couple, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And they're, they're, they have a very, and I always like tell people, if you get that joke, then that means you're old enough to be one of my clients. You know, <laughs> just, um, so, and, and their goal is very simple. They live in a house, and they want to live in their house until they die, and they want to be buried in the backyard. And after that, they want to be dividing all of their assets among their three children. Um, and that's their situation. They own a home, and then Frank has an IRA, they have an annuity, they have bank accounts, so their total assets are worth about $625,000. Frank has Social Security of $2,000, and Mary has half of his, so she's getting $1,000. So between the two of them, they're living on $36,000 a year, or $3,000 a month. Now, a common misconception that people have is that in this situation, if Mary needed a lot of care and needed to be in a nursing home, that, that these folks, if they hadn't done any kind of preparation, uh, we're, gonna need, we're not going to be able to qualify for mass health, and we're going to be needing to use a lot of their assets, and they don't have a huge amount of assets. They have their house and $325,000, which is not a lot at nursing home costs. Typical nursing home costs you about $12,000 a month now. There's an assumption that these folks in that case would need to spend um, a lot of money. The, that, that's not the case. That's not the case, and the reason for that is that if Mary needed to qualify for mass health in this situation, while she needs to show that she is poor, because mass health and all of Medicaid is really health insurance for the poor, so she needs to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, being the spouse at home, can own the home itself as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, so he can, he can own a pretty big house. He can have cash or cash equivalent assets in addition to the home of up to $119,220. And in addition to that, most importantly, he can have infinite income, infinite income. So if Mary were going to, a, would, were, were needing to qualify for mass health because she were in a nursing home, what I would tell Mary to do uh, is use the power of attorney, hopefully, that she had, because the, the one document that I always tell seniors that they have to have, you don't have to have a will, you have to have a power of attorney so that if you're incapacitated, someone can help you and deal with things for you. Use the power of attorney that she has. She needs to shift all of her assets. She needs to shift all of her assets to Frank, which she can do at any time. There is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. Most people don't realize that. They always hear about this five-year look-back period. Doesn't apply to spouses. So she could transfer everything on day one. On day two, Frank, who would now have all of these assets, remember he'd have the house plus uh, uh, cash or cash equivalents of about $325,000. He would go buy an annuity 
What is an annuity? An annuity is, a, is an income stream. It's a promise by an insurance company to pay you, typically in monthly installments, money. So you give them money and they agree to pay you back money uh, in monthly installments. As long, hi, how are you? As long as the purchase of that annuity is for a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and in these slides, I had noted earlier, Frank, is, Frank and Mary are both 80 years old. So Frank's actuarial life expectancy at 80 is about eight years or nine years. As long as that is the, the term is for less than that period, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. So you saw the numbers here. Frank would probably he has $325,000. He'd probably keep $100,000 in his own account and buy an annuity for $225,000. If Frank had a million dollars, he could keep $100,000 in his account and buy an annuity for $900,000. That would all be okay. As long as in the day after he bought that annuity, Mary could qualify for mass health because she has less than $2,000, he then has less than $119,220, and he owns the house. So as long as the two of them are alive, as long as the two of them are alive, they don't have to have done all this advanced planning. They just want to make sure that, in, in, that at the time that, she, that Mary goes to the nursing home, or Frank, that they take these steps. The only issue that could arise, of course, is what happens if Frank dies? If Frank dies, then what he should do, instead of having the estate plan that he always thought he wanted, which was, if I die, I want to leave everything to Mary, is he wants to change his will to say that upon his death, his assets will go into trust, into a testamentary trust, a trust in the will for the benefit of his wife. If he does that, and dies owning any assets, like in this case, if everything has been shifted to him and he has that will that says everything goes into trust, upon his death, all those assets remain safe. Even if Mary's in the nursing home, the assets remain safe. The trustees, which would probably be one of his children, can use those assets to supplement Mary's care, but none of the money has to be used on the nursing home. So the main thing is, if both people are alive, everything's fine. If one of them has died and left everything in trust for the benefit of the other, everything is fine. But let's deal with the other case, because that's what this seminar is really about, or a lot of it, is what happens if Frank has died and they haven't done that planning, and now Mary owns all of these assets. So she owns the, all the cash and stuff, and she has the house. And now her income has gone up to $2,000 a month, which was Frank's Social Security amount. And now Mary gets sick. Now what? Now this is the point at which the most people will tell you that a lot of this money has to get spent down before Mary can qualify for mass health. And it is true that Mary has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets before she can qualify for mass health. Now the house in this case, by the way, is not a countable asset. So Mary could just spend down the $325,000 on the nursing home at the rate of $12,000 a month, that's pretty typical around here, that money's gonna last for about two years. And then she'll qualify for MassHealth, MassHealth will put a lien on the house and wanna get repaid at the time of her death. That's one option, and that's the option that the nursing home will typically tell you is the one that you, that you should be doing. But it's not the only option. Uh, in order to understand the other options, you need to know about this. Um, you know that private pay room for which Mary is paying $12,000 a month? Um, once she has qualified for Mass Health, that room, the same bed in the same nursing home, is going to cost $7,000 a month. That's the amount that, that the nursing home has agreed to accept from Mass Health. Now, these figures are rounded. Actually, the way Mass Health does this is they negotiate separate contracts with every single nursing home. They divide payments into 10 different categories depending on the estimated number of nurse minutes per day that a person in the nursing home needs. And the more nurse minutes you need, the more they pay. That said, 7,000 is pretty much about the average of, of, of what they're gonna be paying these nursing homes. Ironically, even for nursing homes, which if you were on private pay, some of them you may be paying $10,000, some of them you may be paying $14,000. Once they're on MassHealth, they're almost getting exactly the same amount from MassHealth. So 
the, the, so the point though is that the, that the difference, if you can have Mary on Mass Health versus having her on private pay is $5,000. Is five thousand dollars. So if you can devise a mechanism through which Mary can qualify for Mass Health before she has spent down all of her assets on private pay, she could, you can save her five thousand dollars per month. Now let's see how that might work. First of all, as we were just discussing, the term that I'm going to use a lot here is the burn rate. What I refer to as the burn rate. It is the rate at which Mary is needing to dip into her savings to pay the nursing home because her income is insufficient to pay the nursing home. So in this case, if the nursing home is charging $12,000 a month, and as you know, Mary's income is $2,000 a month, the burn rate is about $10,000 per month. Uh, at that rate, if Mary had $325,000, and that's, remember, that's the total of her, ca her assets other than her cash. If she had $325,000, if she was spending down that money, the money will last 32.5 months, $10,000 a month right? Um, or she could sell her home, turn that into money, in which case the money, all $625,000, will last 62.5 months or about five years. So if Mary decides that she just wants to stay on private pay, all of her assets will evaporate after five years. Now, the question is whether, by whether she can qualify for mass health and therefore reduce that burn rate by reducing the amount which has to be paid to the nursing home every month. Because remember, her income is $2,000. If the nursing, if we can get her on Mass Health so that the nursing home only has to be paid $7,000 a month, that means she can save $5,000 a month, a huge amount. So how does she do that? Um, here are the basic Mass Health rules. Um, the, the home is not countable. Other assets are countable but have to be reduced to $2,000, less than $2,000. And once that has happened, Mass Health will pay the difference between Mary's income, which has to be paid to the nursing home, and whatever this agreed rate is, which we're using the figure $7,000. There's, there's a small difference, and that is that Mass Health will allow Mary to keep $72.80 per month to take care of all of her personal needs. All of her personal needs. Other than that, though, every dollar has to go to the nursing home. And by the way, as I've mentioned, the home is not a countable asset. But once um, Mary is on Mass Health, all of her income has to go to the nursing home, which means even though she has a home, she no longer has money to pay the taxes or the insurance or any of the maintenance on the house or a mortgage if there's anything on the house. So that house is a problem. So Mass Health will pay the nursing home that difference, right? And then, and then at this point, Mass Health would put a lien on the house to make sure that following Mary's death, whatever Mass Health is paid was going to get reimbursed to Mary. So that's how the Mass Health system works. Now, the question is how, given those rules, how Mary could restructure her assets in order to qualify for Mass Health. Remember, she could, can't give them away at this point because her husband's dead. One alternative would be she could remarry. I haven't had that happen yet, right? That's the easiest thing for Mary to do is find herself a husband to whom she can just give everything and now she's going to be fine, but you know, the chances of that are slim. So here are her other possibilities. She can buy an annuity, she can loan all of the money to her kids, or she could go in, she could put the money in a D4C pooled trust. We're going to spend some time now talking about a lot about the annuity and the pooled trust and so that you can understand these concepts. But the key, key is to understand that she has these three ways, all of which work, all of which are legitimate ways of converting her assets um, into something that isn't countable by Mass Health. And using any combination of these, she can immediately qualify for Mass Health. So, first, the annuity. Um, remember the, new, the annuity that I described that Frank could buy if we had shifted all the assets to Frank so, and then had Frank buy an annuity to get him below the $119,220, right? Well, Mary can buy the same annuity, right? As it happens, she is, and as, as, as long as the annuity is paying her equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her life expectancy, she can buy an annuity in any amount. Once again, if she had a million dollars, she could go buy an annuity for a million dollars and then just take these monthly payments and qualify for Mass Health. She wouldn't want to in that case for reasons we'll get into, but she always could. So 
There have to be equal monthly payments over her actuarial life expectancy. Now, once she is receiving those payments, those payments are income. And therefore, that income is going to have to be paid to the nursing home together with her other income. And MassHealth will pay the difference between that total income and that magic $7,000 a month, right? And when Mary dies, MassHealth is going to expect to be reimbursed for the amount that they pay, that $2,000, right? So the effect of this will be, at the end of the day, that Mary will have paid $7,000 per month to the nursing home. 7,000, just like if she had been on, if she had simply done none of this, spent down all of her cash, simply qualified for MassHealth, she'd be paying $2,000 a month to the nursing home and the MassHealth would be paying $5,000. The point is, you know, in that, in that case, there'd be no reimbursement because she would have used up her money. So she's paying all of the money to the nursing home. The, 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 the reason for doing this, though, is you're cutting the nursing home bill from $12,000 a month to $7,000 a month and thereby saving Mary $5,000 a month in the amount that is getting paid. <coughs> see how this is working? And we're going to use some examples so you can kind of see how this would work. So once again, there's Mary and there are her numbers. So she's got a house, $300,000. She's got this um, $325,000 in cash. There's her income, $2,000 a month. So if she takes all of her $325,000 and uses it to buy an annuity, her life expectancy at this point is nine years. And by the way, the, it, people always say, well, how can that be? She's, how can she be that old and have a life expectancy of nine, of nine years? Well, if you, if you were zero today, if you were born today, if you were Mary, a woman, you would have a life expectancy in the mid-70s, right? If Mary were 100 today, she would have a life expectancy of two years, right? By virtue of being 100. She always has a life, because your life expectancy doesn't go down as fast as your life does. So if Mary were 100 right now, she'd have a life expectancy of two years. Uh, she, if she were over uh, 90, sure, her life expectancy would be about four years. So her life expectancy is nine years. So she, if she went and bought a, an, an annuity for the longest period that she could, which would be about nine years or 108 months, right? And if we assume that she's getting practically no interest on that annuity, no income, and they're just giving her back her money. And, and by the way, they do pay you a little bit on these annuities, but trust me, not much, right? It did, you would never buy this annuity as an investment, only to qualify for mass health, right? So if she were buying that annuity, it would generate a payment of $3,000 a month for those nine years. And so her income would therefore have gone up from $2,000 a month, which is her social security, to now $5,000 a month. Now remember, um, the mass health rate is $7,000 per month, right? The burn rate um, that she is, at which she is having to use up her money is $5,000 per month. By buying the annuity, she is basically extending the life of her money from, or the, the, the point at which all of the assets would be eliminated from about five years to about 10 years. So she's really extending the period of time during which if she dies, there'll still be some money left, right? Uh, and she's increasing the amount that would be left at any particular year um, if she died during that, during, in, during that earlier period. And I'm gonna give you some more examples of why it is that that happens. She can, so that's one alternative, she can buy that annuity. A similar, a similar thing is that she can actually lend all this money to her children. She could take all $325,000 and give it to any one of her children, Peter, Paul, or Mary, have them sign a promissory note a promissory note back to her. Um, under current mass health regs, that promissory note does not have to even be secured, right? Uh, it has to pay interest. The interest rate, though, can simply be what's called the federal rate, the minimum rate that, you're, that, you're, that the federal government says you can use on a, on a promissory note, which right now I think is less than 2%. Um, it has to have a similar term. It can't, the term can, it has to pay monthly payments over a term that can't exceed her life expectancy. So the payments are gonna look very similar, right? So that's another option. We have not recommended that clients use this option because in other states, promissory notes are not allowed. They're allowed, in, uh, annuities are allowed in all states. And we are afraid that it's gonna change in Massachusetts. But right now you can do that. So there are two possibilities for dealing with that money. A third possibility is the D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a D4C pooled trust. <laughs> This is an obscure thing. Uh, the, the, the term D4C 
is actually the last three letters of a very long um, um, statutory citation from, a, from, a, from the, the statute that created uh, Medicaid. It's actually 42 U.S.C. 1396P, 1A, and then, then it's D4C. So the last three initials are the, are, so this simply refers to the section of the federal code that allows people to do what I'm about to describe. If you want to learn more about pooled trusts, Google pooled trusts, right? What they are, um, they are administered, Google pooled trusts have to be administered by uh, a nonprofit that is d working for the benefit of disabled or older people, or both. Uh, and what they will, and these are the five of them that are, that are um, licensed and in, in, exist here in Massachusetts. And what they do is, if you give them your money, if Mary gave them her $325,000, they would pool it with all of the other money they've been given and invest the money, hence the name pooled trusts. They would, though, keep track of her $325,000 in her separate account for accounting purposes, and their mandate is to use that money in any way that would benefit Mary for the rest of her life. But they don't have to use it to pay the nursing home, to pay the nursing home. And by transferring it in to the D4C, Mary for nursing home, for mass health purposes, has reduced her money by the amount that she's transferred to the D4C. Now, what can this money be used for? It can be used literally for anything. It can be used while Mary is alive, if you want to, to buy better furniture for Mary in the nursing home room, to buy a better bed, or most importantly, to buy a better wheelchair. Anybody here been to a nursing home? Yeah, so you know, to, yeah, so you know, you know what a nursing home is like. For me, the most depressing part of a nursing home is going to the hall and seeing the people sitting there in those wheelchairs sleeping, trying to sleep, like this, right? Now, the reason why that is happening is because they're in the wrong wheelchair, right? They're in a wheelchair, costs about $1,000, the nursing home owns it, and it's, it, the purpose of the wheelchair is to push people from one room to another. It is not to have people sleep, right? For $10,000, you can buy a wheelchair that reclines, you can even get them that are motorized. You may not want to get it motorized, but you can, right? You can, and it has a cup holder, and it has a little TV, and it has all of these wonderful things, right? It must be big. It's, they're big. They're big. Um, but, it, but they fit through the doors. They fit through the doors. And, and the D4C will pay for that, right? Or for the flat screen TV. Or for the, or for the and, and the headphones, so that you don't have to be listening to the TV set of the person next to you. The worst part of being in a nursing home is listening to the other person's TV set. I was in a nursing home this morning, in a lady's room, and the other TV set not only is always on, but it's always on in Spanish. The other person is, is, is Spanish speaking, right? So it's really gobbledygook to this person, right? Very disorienting, right? So all of that, um, better food. Now that's the reason for my lobster. There's, there is a, there is a, uh, a, a, I had a wonderful client who I had done one of these presentations. This woman came up to me afterwards and she said, oh, Mr. Bergeron, she said, uh, I don't, you know, I've heard about the D4C. This might have been great for my mother, but it, it's kind of too late. I mean, I had, we had a quarter of a million dollars, but I've already spent it down to 60,000. She's been in for a couple of years at the nursing home. And it, and it really wouldn't be worth it for the 60,000. And I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, except paying nursing home bills, $60,000 is a lot of money, right? She's thinking she's only got five months left because that's how much the nursing home was going to cost and the money was going to be all gone. I said, Put it all into the D4C, and you'll have this pot of money to provide for your mother for anything she needs for the rest of her life. Because she was already like 92, right? So she did. And we moved all the money to the D4C. And, and the lady from the, and the D4C has social workers who are assigned to the individuals who are in the nursing homes to try to figure out how to use the money, how to best help them, right? So they were she was talking to the daughter and said to the daughter, said, so what, do you, what does your mother want? You know, do you think... Does she watch movies? We can get a flat screen TV and the, and, the, and, the, and the headphones and any movie she wants. Oh no, she's blind actually, right? Well, this, uh, how about music? You know, we can get her, you know, with great CD set player and all of this stuff. Well, actually she can't hear very well either. This woman was pretty old and she'd been in the nursing home for a while. And so the woman said, well, does she have any favorite foods? 
And, and the woman said, oh, oh yeah. She said, you know, we grew up poor. You know, we didn't have a lot of money. There were three or four kids and my father worked all the time. But a couple times a year, we would go out, they would treat us and we would go out for lobster. My mother loved lobster. And the lady literally looked at her and said, your mother can have lobster anytime she wants, right? I later heard from the lady, the, the mother lived for three more years and she had lobster at least once a week for three years. It was like more than she'd had in her entire life she had. And, 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 and my point is, so what's so bad about that, right? This lady saved money their whole life. They saved, you know, what was $250,000, right? Most of it went to the nursing home, right? Why was it so bad that she actually got to have a little bit of this extra money? So another thing that you can do with the money, by the way, is if, and, and this, this I find with, this is not as much with the dementia folks, but there are many, there are probably 20% of the people in nursing homes are there with serious physical problems, but still have a lot of cognitive ability. Um, you can take them on a trip, right? You can just take them on a trip, any place, any place. The Cape, Boston, Florida, Hawaii, any place. The D4C will pay the whole thing. They'll also pay for the person who's going with them because that person needs to be there in order to take care of them, right? Or the house. Remember I talked about the fact one of the problems you qualify with for mass health and there's a lien on the house, and not only that, but there's no money to pay the taxes and the insurance and anything. Well, the D4C can pay all that stuff, right? So, you can, Mary could put any amount of money into this D4C um, at any time. And, and, and like with the annuity, if she dies and, 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 and there's still money around, MassHealth has a lien on that money to get repaid. But once again, the total amount of payment to the, to counting the repayment to MassHealth and to the nursing home amounts to a burn rate of only $5,000 a month, right? So why wouldn't you automatically put all the money just in the D4C? The, uh, the answer is this, that when Mary dies, before any payments get made back to the nurse, to, to Mass Health to reimburse them, or to the children or whoever else is supposed to get the money once Mass Health has been paid, the, the D4C will keep up to 20% of the money that is still in the account, right? Um, they don't just like, you know, use it to go to wild parties. They're, a, they're nonprofits. They use the money to, to, to fund their mission, which is to help um, disabled and older people, right? But the point is, from your perspective, if you're trying to maximize the possible amount of money that might be left over, right, you, you may not want to put all the money in the D4C, because if you put the money in the D4C, if, if Mary does and then she dies the next day, the D4C is going to keep, in that case, probably 10% of the money. So if she would have just, and if, and if she would have put it in, all of the money in, and then die after two years, um, the D4C will keep 20%, leaving only $260,000 available to pay back the mass health lien and then for final distribution. So you would, have, you would have lost some of this additional money, right? So that's the reason why you may not want to put all the money in the D4C. What you may want to do, uh, and this is what we typically advise people do, is you, we kind of talk through this with them. Do some kind of a blended deal where you put some money in the, in the annuity and some in the D4C. Uh, for example, um, if you were to take Mary's uh, $325,000, and once again, we're figuring that the, that the, the burn rate on the money is $5,000, is about $5,000 a year, because when she's on Mass Health, Mary's nursing home bill is $7,000 a month. Right now, she has the ability to pay $2,000 a month. Well, the ideal amount to pay to the nursing home is the exact amount that Mass Health would have paid to the nursing home. Because that way, there's no lien that accumulates. Right? So the ideal annuity amount in this case would be $5,000 a month. So that that, together with her regular income, equaled $7,000 a month. So that the nursing home every month was getting exactly the $7,000 that it needed. And no mass health lien was accumulating because mass health wasn't paying anything. And at the end of the day, you just get a, whatever is left over, right? So if you did that in this case, if you bought an annuity that was going to have payments of about $5,000 a month, um, and you took uh, $240,000 out of her $325,000 and did that, you would ha you'd be able to pay those payments for four years. So if you took a guess and said, well, you know, I think Mary is going to live some time, but not forever. You know, she's older now. She's pretty, you know, she's got dementia. She's got problems anyway. So I'm just going to guess 
right, that that's probably going to be enough. And I'm going to take the rest of the money and put it in the D4C. And then um, upon Mary's death, if, if none of the money had been used, if you use all of it, that's fine. By the way, you can use all the money in the D4C, right? And there's no penalty in any way. If you, you know, if MassHealth doesn't have anything left to get, that's, all, that's the way it goes. So you can use it all. So my case of the woman that just had the $60,000, that's what I always recommend in cases where there aren't a lot of assets. Put it all in the D4C should probably, and use it all up. Just use it all up. So in this case, if none of that money had been used, the penalty for having it in the D4C would only be 20% of that $85,000, or a fairly small amount. So you see, one, now once again, I'm not, I'm not trying to give you, an, a, in, none of these may be your answers, but I want you to just get a sense of how this might work. And the answer to so many of these, these questions as to whether you want to do any of these things is you need to do the math. And you need to figure out what your situation is. What, is. what do you think is Mary's actuarial life expectancy? How long do you think she might be in the nursing home? What do you think her D4C needs might be? If she's 92 and she's blind and can't hear and is pretty much bedridden, that's different from that relatively healthy person, well, meant that cognitively healthy person who has physical problems but might still be able to travel, maybe living another 20 years, you know, you don't, you don't know. So there are all of those things you want to figure out. So now I'm just going to give you a couple of other examples to show you in different situations how this might play out. So in this case, so suppose Mary's assets, instead of being the house plus $325,000, were the house plus just $75,000. Well, this probably would be a classic case where you'd put all the money in the D4C. You've got a relatively small amount of money, which will probably be plenty to take care of all of Mary's supplementary needs for all of her life. And the other asset is the house. So once you've moved the money into the D4C, remember the house is an exempt asset. She can qualify for MassHealth. MassHealth will put a lien on the house, but from the time that happens, the nursing home rate will be $7,000 a month. So instead of her selling the house and paying the nursing home at, at, at pay, do, having a burn rate of $10,000 a month, she keeps the house, effectively has a burn rate of $5,000 a month, and has this money on the side to take care of Mary and also to take care of the house. Because remember, that's the issue. If she keeps the house, she wants somebody or some money to pay the taxes and the insurance, et cetera. But what if, and we talked about that, but what if Mary's in, income, what if Mary's assets are much bigger than these numbers? Um, or what if her income is very different? In that case, you need to go back and kind of think about the implications of the five-year look-back period. So I want to talk about this for a few minutes. Most people think of the five-year look-back period uh, in terms of doing advanced planning so that they're protecting assets so in case they need a nursing home, the assets are safe. Uh, the, the, once again, as a brief, his, in, to put this in historical context, when, when Mass Health, when Medicaid was passed in the 1960s, there was no look-back period, right? You could qualify for Medicaid literally by giving your assets away one day and then the next day you could qualify, right? Well, that didn't stay for very long because finally the, gov the government immediately realized they had made a mistake here, right? And so almost immediately, within a few years, um, the, the Medicaid law got amended and they imposed a one-year look-back period. And that one-year look-back period stayed until about 1991 when it was extended to three years. Uh, and then to 2006 when it was extended to five years. And the concept behind the look-back period is Medicaid is supposed to be for poor people. And so you don't want people who are simply voluntarily impoverishing themselves and then immediately qualifying for Medicaid. That wasn't the point. Um, and, and the point of the look back periods is to basically say to people, if you have given away things, that is, if you've transferred assets for less than fair market value during this look back period, then when you go to apply for MassHealth, um, they're going to want to know about that. They're going to want you to submit five years worth of financial statements on behalf of Mary to make sure she didn't do this. And if she did, they're going to take the amount that she gave away and they're going to basically impose a period of ineligibility on Mary equal to the value of that amount of money if she were using it for the nursing home. Basically as a way of forcing the money to show up again, right? Forcing the kids to give it back or whatever. So that's kind of the concept behind the look back period. But a crucial thing to know about the look back is that it is a look back from the time that you're applying to Mass Health not from the time you go to the nursing home. So you can be in the nursing home but not applying for MassHealth 
And this look back period keeps on clicking along until you've applied for Mass Health. So if Mary went into the nurse, so suppose Mary, and once again, remember that the burn, you know, the, this worst case, the burn rate is, is uh, $10,000 if you're on private pay, if Mary's on private pay as opposed to being on Mass Health. And if she were on private pay over a five year period, uh, this is gonna cost her $600,000. Now in the example that I had given you, where Mary's assets are $625,000, it's not going to do her much good to give away all of her assets and then pay the nursing home for the five years because all she's going to have left at the end of the five years is $25,000. But what if she had a million one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars What if uh, instead of having a house worth $300,000, she had one worth $500,000? And what if her, her husband's IRA, instead of being $150,000, was $450,000? So they had a lot more assets. Income was the same. Well, in that case, if they private paid for five years, and, and if, they, if, if the moment Mary went to the nursing home, they immediately transferred all the money out just to the kids. They can just give it to the kids. And by the way, there's no gift tax on that. There's this, allude, there's this myth that if you give your children more than $14,000 in a year, you pay a gift tax. It's not true. You can give them up to $5.4 million. So for most people, you can give them as much as you want. So if, if the, the, if, the, if Mary simply gave away all the assets right away um, so that she had less than $2,000, right? And then they just started paying the nursing home every month, right? At the burn rate, because Mary's income is going to the nursing home of the 2,000 and they see pulled money out of this 1,125. At the end of five years, there's still $525,000 left, which has escaped, right? Now, it may be that you don't want to do that. Um, and, and one of the reasons is, well, this is just kind of the basic comparison. If Mary did that, then at the end of five years, she would have paid $600,000, right? If instead she qualified for Mass Health and then was paying, you know, doing that combination of payments and the lien or whatever, at the Mass Health rate, she would have only paid $300,000. So her savings at the end of that period was $300,000. So at the end of five years, in comparison, the smart move would have been to qualify um, Mary for Mass Health. But, what, but remember, the thing about gifting it all away and getting through the five years is at the end of the five years, you're done. You're done. Whatever's left over is safe. Whereas if Mary lives for 10 years, right? If we've qualified Mary for Mass Health and she lives for, t and she lives for 10 years at this burn rate, She's going to owe six hundred thousand. She's going to owe six hundred thousand dollars, right? T Ten years times that five thousand dollars per year. So if you really think the person's going to live for a long time, right? Then you may want to simply take the hit, pay on private pay for five years, knowing that the rest of it is safe. Or if you've got a lot more money, if you've got a lot more money, if you've got two million dollars, right? You may decide that's the, just the smarter move. A second time that you may want to think of that is, suppose Mary's assets are the same here, but suppose her income is different. Suppose she earns $4,000 a month instead of $2,000 a month. That's not uncommon, right? Among, I have a lot of folks who get very little in assets, but they are like two retired teachers, right? Or a retired teacher and the husband had, had a pension, right? And when they all add it, up, add it all up, 4,000 gross is $4,000 a month, right? 4,000 a month or more. And remember when you're paying the nursing home, by the way, I just, it's, as an observation, if you're paying the nursing home with that money, right, all of the payments to the nursing homes are a medical deduction. So, uh, so that, that you're no longer paying any taxes on any of that money, right? You're just paying it all to the nursing home as a medical deduction. So they're, they're getting all of it. So suppose that was her income. And suppose in addition to that, I'm just using this as an example, they had bought some long-term care insurance. Not a big policy. This is not a big policy. $200 a day for five years. You never ever want to buy a long-term care insurance policy for more than five years. All you ever want is a long-term care insurance policy that's going to fill this hole till you get past the look back period, right? So suppose she had done that so that her income is now $10,000 a month. 4,000 which was her regular income and then 6,000 a month being paid by the long-term care insurance policy, right? Which means Remember, on private pay, she's paying 12,000 a month, and her income is now 10,000. So her burn rate 
is now only $2,000 a month. And at the end of five years, all that she's burned up is $120,000, right? And the rest of it is now all safe. She gave everything away. She paid, she used all of her other income. She, the, 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 the extra that she had to use out of this 625 was $120,000 and she still got, or the kids have still got $500,000, right? So I guess once again, I'm just doing this by way of suggesting these are kind of situation specific. If your income is really high, then this kind of strategy makes a lot of sense, right? Or if you've got a whole lot of other assets or if you think someone's gonna live for a really long time. Um, once again, 625,000 minus that 120, she's got 500, th th they've got $505,000 completely safe. Because remember, at the end of those five years, the first day following the fifth anniversary of that transfer, Mary can apply for Mass Health and everything is safe. Okay, see how that works? Uh, I'm gonna just give you a couple of others. These are kind of niche deal uh, or issues. One, the caregiver child. If Peter Paul or Mary Jr. were living with Mary at home for at least two years, and if in the opinion, if there is medical documentation that Mary during those two years, were it not for that caregiver, would have needed to be in the nursing home because she needed help. The standard as to whether you needed to be in the nursing home is whether you need help with two of the activities of daily living, which are um, uh, dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, and transferring. Transferring means getting up out of a chair, walking across a room, and sitting down. Or if you need constant supervision, because otherwise you might just wander away, right? If, if, that, if one of those children can live in the house for two years and show that that, that, that is the case, that, that their presence in the house kept Mary from going to the nursing home, and if Mary goes right from the house to the nursing home, then Mary at that point can give that child the house. Can just give them the house. It's an exemption, caretaker child exemption. Only applies to kids, not grandchildren, not nieces and nephews, definitely not the spouse, but you're the spouse, that's a different issue, right? Only the kids. So if you've got somebody like that, you have to adopt them, right? That's the kind of the main thing. Um, the other possibility is long-term care insurance of a different kind. Um, Long-term care insurance is very expensive if you're buying a large policy, like that $200 uh, a day policy for five years, that can be pretty pricey. But if you own this policy, starting off with it, I'm first talking about this one because people are always tempted when they have these little policies to, to just dump them because they figure this is a worthless policy, right? If you have a policy that was dated prior to March 15th, 1999, and it Get, and it would pay, promise to pay, up to $50 a day in nursing home costs with an exclusion period of up to 100 days. The exclusion period means that the policy only starts paying the nursing home in day 101, right? And if the policy from that point was gonna pay the nursing home for two years, 730 days, right? Um, and if you go directly from your home to the nursing home, and if at that point, that policy has at least one day left worth of juice left in it, one day, so that you, maybe you've used up the other days because Mary was in and out of the nursing home or whatever, but it's got at least one day left. And when she fills in the mass health application, Mary says she does not intend to return home, then the house is safe. The house is safe. It's not a countable asset. It's not subject to a lien. It's not subject to a state recovery no matter what the value of the house. It can be a $2 million house. I tell people, I do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, and I tell everybody in Nantucket, you have to have this policy. Because every house is worth like half a million dollars. The little, little houses in downtown Nantucket are all worth more than a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. This protects the house 100% now. But you say, March 15th, 1999? Well, if it's after that, the only change is the policy has to be worth $125 a day. The elimination period, though, can be up to a year, right? As long as the policy will pay the nursing home for 730 days after that, $125 a day. And as long as you have at least one day left, and as long as you go directly to the nursing home from your home, the house is safe. So if you're married and you're already, and you're younger, right? Because you're not gonna get any of these policies if you're, under, if you're over 70. But if you're, under, if you're under 70 and you don't have a serious medical condition, you can probably buy this policy and it's not gonna cost you very much, right? 
And if the, and if the number of, regarding how much per day has to be paid goes up later on, chances are your policy is going to be grandfathered. And it's going to save your house, right? By the way, one of the planning techniques that Mary would use in this case if she had that policy and she were getting dementia is buy a new house. Just buy a new house. Take all the money, right? Sell the existing house, buy a house, any size. $625,000. Next day she goes to the nursing home, house is safe. House is safe. It can be a house of any size. It's, a, it's an amazing loophole. Dare I use that word as an attorney? It's an amazing loophole. We already talked about the wills with the asset protection um, trusts. And if you want to see this again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. There it is, Elder Law with Frank and Mary. We've got about 80 shows there. And one of them will be this one that we'll be uploading to the station. And the goal of all of this, as I always tell my clients, is to sleep well at night. Right? So all of this may be irrelevant to you, but if you've been worrying about it, hopefully this gives you some ways of getting better sleep. Because as I, always fi as I find with all of my older clients, and I'm finding it with myself, the older you get, money, power, fame, they're all irrelevant. You just want to get a good night's sleep. Right? So that's kind of the goal. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for anybody? Yes, ma'am, or you, sir? Yes, sir. If Frank, if Frank and Mary start out having individual trusts yeah. that are revocable. Yeah. Can this work? Uh, yes, the revocable trusts don't do anything for them, right? And if one of them go, went to a nursing home, they would need to, at that point, take all the assets out of the trusts and transfer those assets to the spouse that is still at home. Because assets in trust, in revocable trust, are 100% countable. Always 100% countable. It's right in the regs, okay? That's number one. Number two, if, if say the assets were in a revocable trust, say Frank had assets in a revocable trust, and he then died, right? And so the assets stayed in trust for Mary's benefit, but the trust was revocable. Once again, for mass health purposes, all those assets would be counted as Mary's assets, right? So the revocable trusts don't do anything for you, and they might hurt you. They might hurt you. Better to have the assets in individual names, right? Because in, it, remember one of the, 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 the suggestions that I made to you regarding how to save things was that you make sure when the first spouse dies that that will says whatever that spouse owns is going to go in a testamentary trust, a trust that's in the will for the benefit of the spouse. In order for that to work, the assets, when that, when that spouse dies, have to be owned in that spouse's name individually. They cannot be in a revocable trust. They have to be owned individually, right? So the, in most cases, a revocable trust hurts you in these cases. Revocable trusts are very handy devices to make sure that you avoid probate because, you were, assets, don't, because assets don't have to go through the probate process because they're in trust. They work great for that. They work terrible for any of this. They don't help you at all, and they actually hurt you in this kind of plan. Okay? okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. We talk about a four a D four C. D four C. Some states don't have it, and Massachusetts has it. All states allow D four Cs. In many states, though, when you transfer funds to a D four C, um, the the look back period gets applied to that transfer. In in Connecticut, in Connecticut, if you transfer funds to a D four C. The D4C is all legit and everything, but the transfer is considered to have been a gift. And so it's subject to that five-year look-back period. Not so in Massachusetts. You can transfer the assets in today, qualify for MassHealth tomorrow. And you said that Massachusetts may stop that D4C. No, no, no it'll keep, there's no, there's no issues about the D4C. Massachusetts, regarding the promissory notes, remember I said as an alternative to doing the annuity and giving your money to an insurance company, you can give it to your kids and have them give you a promissory note back. There, other states have abolished that or have put more uh, contingencies on it saying that, that those assets have to be secured by a mortgage or there have to be more controls because of the, of course, inevitable concern that if you lend the money to your kids, right, they might, have, they might spend it all and might not be able to pay it back and then, you know, mass health would have to go sue them and they don't want to, you know, they may not want to go there. It's still allowable now. Right? I just, I'm, I'm as, I do nothing but this work, and so I spend a lot of time seeing kind of what's coming. 
and I think that's what's coming. But I don't. But the annuity, I think, is going to stay as a valid way of handling this. Okay. Yes, sir. Are the pool trusts regulated, you know, by like say the attorney general or? Oh, I mean, so is somebody watching to see if the money doesn't end up going to a copper mine in yeah. Thailand yes. or something? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Those are all. Those are, and it is the attorney general because these are all nonprofits, so they're reporting regularly. And these are pretty big pooled trusts. The one that we use the most is called Plan of Massachusetts. I think they have about 30 million in trust uh, that they're managing. Actually, we've provided about four million of that because we've used it a lot. We do, once again, we do a lot of this kind of work, right? Um, and, the, and the rates of return, my clients tell me, are actually pretty good, right? Because they're, they, they're paying attention, right? And, they're, and the, what, the way they do it is they'll talk to you every year so that they can get a sense of how much Mary would need for that year. Um, and, and they'll keep that money kind of available, and then they do the rest of the money. They do, they have, they do have investment managers and stuff. And so they've gotten pretty good returns. And the initial sign-up cost for that is about, I want to say, it, this varies, but around $750. And then on an annual basis, they'll charge you like a point, right, for managing the money. Um, but but it, people have found that the return has been okay. And once again, I'm not saying this is where you would go if it weren't for the fact that you were trying to qualify for a nerf for mass up, right? But it's a wonderful alternative. It's a wonderful, especially for people who have got kind of limited resources, right? Want to park some money. Because as I say, you can use up all the money and there's nothing bad about that. You know, taking care of Mary, right? So she gets to use her own money. Now, if there's nothing left, there's nothing left, or the Mass Health has a lien on it, but that's okay. But at least during Mary's lifetime, she doesn't have to live on seventy-two dollars and forty cents a month, right? Uh, in instead of using some of the money that she saved all of her life and not giving it to the nursing home, I'm a big fan of the D4Cs for that reason. Any other questions? Well, yes. So any how questions? do you avoid probate and have this? Probate can't. Features? You can't. You can't. You cannot avoid probate. So you need to decide. No, I mean either you, one. You can't. It's an either or. You either, if, if, if the goal is to make sure that when one spouse dies, the assets are safe for the benefit of the surviving spouse, you cannot avoid probate. This has to go through probate. There have been, I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I deal with lawyers all the time. There have been dozens of attempts to avoid this, to try to have people structure things so that you've got a trust that avoids the probate. And maybe you have a pour over will that technically pours things into the trust, but most of the assets are in the trust. There have been a million of these, all failed. There are a lot of disappointed people that have tried doing any of those things. The reason for that is th these cases have gone up to the court a lot, right? And the court has said, this is a loophole. It is a congressionally mandated loophole. This comes out of the language of the statute, right? That says that these trusts aren't subject to the usual rules that the money has to be used for the nursing home. Right? And so the court has said, we're going to interpret this narrowly, just the way they interpret any uh, income tax loopholes, narrowly, because it's clearly a loophole. So you've got to choose. Okay, we're talking about nursing home. What if we don't have to go to nursing home? Don't go to a nursing home. If, you're, if you don't need to go to a nursing stay home, home, if you're staying home, stay home, then the only, well, if, if you can be sure you're not going to a nursing home and that you're not going to need a lot of care at home, well, then you don't need to do this. As long as you're really sure. I've always had clients say, I'll never go to a nursing home. I'm going to shoot myself. People have been telling me that for 40 years. No one has taken the bullet yet. Hire a helper to come in. Ah, and, and by the way, I'm going to do a separate presentation on that in the spring because there is a big mass health program to allow people to stay at home. If you can show mass health that you are otherwise eligible for nursing home care because you need help with those activities of daily living, then MassHealth will also pay a big, big amount of money. They'll pay up to 50 hours a week of home care to allow you to stay at home, right? Except that MassHealth then has a lien in order to, re to collect their money back after you've died, and so we're gonna talk about kind of how that would work, okay? Good. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the food, which I didn't make, right? And I hope you'll come to the next one. The next one, although it may not be relevant to you, once again, it's a specific issue. We're gonna talk specifically about people who have got social security issues and all for one spouse, and then the other spouse has got, uh, it was a public employee. And so you're trying to figure out how all of that stuff works. So it's, it's, that, it's meant for a different, but then the third one will probably be relevant to you, but we'll keep you informed of these. And thank you very much for coming, and I hope you sign.